Good morning, everyone. If we haven't had a chance to meet, my name's Regina Kellogg, and I'm subbing today for the team that's usually here, and it's great to be here with, with you in worship today. Welcome to the Grove, and we are excited to worship the Lord this morning. And I'm going to start by um, leading you in a call to worship that comes from Psalm 9, 1 and 2. So listen as I read these words. I will thank the Lord with all my heart. I will declare all your wondrous works, and I will rejoice and boast about you. I will sing about your name, Most High. And that's why we're here this morning. If you're able, would you stand? I'm sitting because I'm playing the piano. I get a free pass. But you can stand and worship. We're going to sing together, and I invite you to sing, sing with me. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I step, hide the ransom for my life, oh, pray with me. Lord, you are so good, and we worship you. We worship you alone today. We thank you for being with us this morning in this place. Fill this place with your presence and be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Well, hey, good morning. Uh, welcome to the Grove. If we have not yet met, my name is Kyle Corcoran, and when you all came in, you should have received a program that looks like this. In the program, you'll get a glimpse of kind of the things that are going on around the Grove. There are a number of meetups that will be coming up here shortly. Also in the program that you'll see that there is a connection card. That connection card looks like this. There's a spot on the front for your name and your email address. And then on the back, there is a spot for prayer requests and other ways to get connected. Also in there, you'll see an envelope. And that envelope is to help those who would like to help move the mission of the Grow Forward. You can fill that out and then put it in the offering box at the back of the service at the end of the service. Also inside this program, there is a a spot for following along during the sermon so that you can follow along during the sermon so you can, uh, you know, you can do that. Um, As as you may know, we've been in this series called Built to Last, and in this series, we we want to take a, we want to look back with gratitude about what God has done here um, in this space and what he's done through us as we've worked together in this space. And so last week, Pastor Christian talked about um, that we, we, can, we, can, we can encounter things that, have, that will leave a lasting impression on us, and we never really take the time to, to look back at them and how they made a lasting impression on us. We just kind of move forward and take the next step forward and take the next step forward, and we really never highlight what happened. We never look back and see and, de- and describe and discuss what happened because, and we want to do this because we want... We want these, these important qualities, these important attitudes, these important attributes to be a part of us as we live and walk with the Lord and as we do our projects together. And one of those attitudes that, that we're going to look at more specifically today is humility. Humility, for, for me, I don't really quite understand humility, and for a lot of people, it's, it's often misunderstood, um, and it's really not easily seen when it's going on. Uh, it's one of those attributes that the Bible talks about all the time. It's, it's actually number two uh, subject in the New Testament of, of attributes that, that God wants his people to have, second to love. But the thing is, is that it's not highly esteemed. Um, it wasn't highly esteemed in Jesus' time, and it's not really this sought-after attitude or character trait um, today even. Because I think that it's misunderstood, as I mentioned earlier. I think that it, it's, it's, it's not something that people were like, yeah, that, that was humility, or yeah, that was humility. People, when, when people think of humility, they, they generally think, oh, like that, that, that person is a doormat, or um, they're, they're, really, they're really not an important person, they're, they're kind of a, a nobody, or they're really just downplaying their abilities. But the way that Jesus describes humility is humility is voluntarily taking the lower position. It's voluntarily taking the lower position. Jesus, he he describes in Luke 14 this scenario where these these people, they're they're looking for the high seat. They're they're sitting in the, the high respected seat. And Jesus is saying, hey, don't be like them. Actually, you should go and sit in the lower seat because... The, the, when you, whenever you sit in the lower seat, the host of the party will say, hey, friend, move up, as opposed to sitting in the higher seat and being asked by the host to, sit, to be moved down in rank, if you will. So sometimes we can voluntarily take the lower position as in an actual seat, or we can take the lower position in regards to attitude. So when you're on the job, you can look at your situation and you can say, how can I use my position how can I use the, the position that the Lord has given me to serve other people? Um, this is the approach that we want airline pilots to take. We don't want them to take the lowest position. Here's why. You don't want them to be the ones serving you your little packages of airline pretzels. And you definitely don't want them to be the ones that are coming around down the aisles right before the plane lands to pick up your trash. You want them to use their skills and their abilities to, to fly the plane. And ultimately, when they're flying the plane, they're serving you. And they're serving the rest of the passengers on that plane. Um, so humility is using your position to serve other people. Um, while humility is often misunderstood, I think that 
when someone is proud, it's usually a little bit easier to see and to understand. So the Greek word for proud, and we're just going to roll with this, it's hyperphanos. It comes from the word uh, hubris, so its root of that word is hubris. And hyperphanos describes someone who is arrogant. It describes someone that's proud, they're, they're overconfident, they're presumptuously conceited, and they're egotistical. Here's a picture of what I think best describes hyperphanos. Uh, this is uh, from 2000. <laughs> This is from 2020, um, and it looks like, based on this picture, that the San Francisco 49ers have won the game based on their reaction, but we, we know that that is not the case. Um, this, their celebration was premature. It was a very uh, good description of presumptuously conceited, um, and they, they, but they could have avoided a lot of humility. I mean, a lot of humility, um, a lot of memes that were kind of directed towards them. They could have avoided a lot of that, and so can we. When we choose to, to go the, the way of humility, and not only can we avoid a lot of uh, humiliation, if you will, but we can avoid a lot of problems. But it, it's often, when, whenever, when, whenever it comes about, we, we don't necessarily always want to choose the humble route. Instead, we, we tend to veer towards choosing the, the way of, of, of pride instead. But yet, pride, it's this thing that we're, we're always going to struggle with. We're always going to be faced with situations in which we're, we're, we have to choose whether or not we have to make a decision. Da daily, when we're on the job, we're, we're going to have to make a choice. We're constantly asking ourselves, we're going to always have to be constantly asking ourselves, which way do I want to go? Do I want to go the way of the humble, or do I want to go the way of the proud? Humility, one, is, is this character trait that is highly valued by God because it is a reflection of his heart. Pride, on the other hand, it's something that he detests. It, it can actually cause um, resistance from the Lord. It can cause opposition. It can even bring humiliation. God brings down the proud. He, he makes them low. Humility, on the other hand, is something that the Lord honors because it is a reflection of his heart. When we choose this way, when we choose to go the way of humility, God can actually, he'll give us wisdom. He, he, he will give us grace. Um, he will give us success in life. And this isn't, not, this isn't necessarily like monetary success, although that can happen. It's more like the avoidance of pitfalls and potholes and just general troubles that are going to come along the way. Um, when, when we're humble, when we choose the way of humility, um, we, we have the opportunity to have a better, deeper, more intimate relationship with him, and we can pursue personal goals or um, group goals together without burning relational bridges. That, this, that's really fascinating to me because I'm, I'm a competitive person. I want, to, I want to win. But to do that without burning in re, any relationships, man, that, that's, really, that's really intriguing to me. In Philippians 2, we get to see uh, Paul, he kind of paints this picture of Jesus and his humility, and he, and he does this so that we know how to go the humble route. This is what Philippians 2 verse 5 says. It says this. It says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. When we, when we adopt something, we're voluntarily making thing, that thing our own. We're doing this by choice. It's something that we want to to do. So Paul is encouraging us, make the mind and the attitude of Christ your own. Deliberately take up his approach to thinking. You're, when, when you do this, you're, you're no longer taking up your own approach to thinking. You're taking up his approach to thinking. You're looking at things from his angle, from God's angle, from his point of view. So not only that you can do what he did, but you can think as he thought. Paul continues. He says, He's, he's describing Jesus. He says, Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant and taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
And as, as I was reading this and as I was preparing for this, I was, uh, I was thinking, like, is there a situation in the Gospels where we get to see this uh, in live action? Is there any situation in the Gospels where we get to see Jesus' high power, his high authority, and yet kind of forsake it? And the answer is yes. It's all throughout the Gospels. It's littered with all of these things. But today we're going to look at Matthew 26, and we're going to see... Uh, how it, right before Jesus is betrayed and during, the, we're going to look at his betrayal and kind of see like he has this privilege. He has this divine authority, yet he forsakes it because he's humble. And so it, um, the, the situation is, is that Jesus and his disciples, they are in the upper room. They're getting ready to uh, partake in Passover, which is now, like it's kind of now the, the Lord's Supper. Uh, he, Jesus describes to his disciples, hey, listen, this is about to go down. Um, then they, then, and then they end up making their way into the Garden of Gethsemane. And as they make their way into the Garden, uh, Jesus like says, hey, like stay here. He moves forward. He begins to pray. Peter, James, and John, they get a little bit closer look about wh- wh- where they get to see Jesus praying. Um, and we, it, when, they, when they get this closer look, they get to see that Jesus is really struggling, that he's really struggling to obey. He's really struggling to, um, to, to, uh, to, to lay down his life, essentially. And they, they get to see him, him pray, um, he, he prays like this, uh, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And then, then he prays again, because he's, he's struggling inwardly. Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. He's looking for another way. Is there another way possible? No, there's not another way. Your will be done. And when he's done, he, he tells, hey, disciples, hey, listen, look, uh, my betrayer is here. And we, we, we get to see Jesus, or we get to see Judas is kind of, he's not leading this, this mob of uh, chief priests and servants and elders. He's not leading them. He's just kind of out in front of them. And Judas indicates to this mob of people, this mob of religious elite people, hey, um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you who Jesus is by giving him a kiss. So he, he comes up to Jesus, he kisses him, he greets him as rabbi, as teacher, and Jesus says, he looks at uh, Judas and he says, hey friend, why have you come? But he had just described fully what was going to go down, that Judas was going to be the one to, to betray him. And after all of the, this event, this exchange, this kiss, this greeting goes down, the religious mob, they, they, they take Jesus, they seize him, and they arrest him. And then Peter does uh, what he thinks that he should do. He whips out his sword, and he cuts off the high priest's servant's ear. But, and, and, then, and then Jesus, he, he turns to Peter, and he says this. He says, put your sword back in its place, because all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. I don't think that Peter fully understands what's going on here. And he, he even takes the, this, this matter into his own hands because I think that he's trying to protect and to serve Jesus. And Jesus looks at Peter, I, well, at least I think that he looks at Peter, and he, he's indicating, hey, listen, this isn't how it's going to go down. I'm, I'm laying down my life, and I'm laying it down willingly. You're not serving me, but I'm actually serving you. I'm doing only what I can do here in this situation. And when Jesus is speaking of his divine privilege that is available to him, that, that he forsakes, that he's putting aside. To show Peter and to show us and to show anyone that has the ability to read the Gospels that he is being obedient to Scripture. He is humbling himself. This is what, th- then he continues, this is what Peter says Jesus says to Peter, listen, he says, Or do you not think that I can call on my Father and he will provide me here and now with more than 12 legions of angels? How then would the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen this way? Now, as a guy, I'm, I'm drawn to power. I'm drawn to uh, cars that are fast. I'm drawn to big trucks. I'm in the midst of this. I didn't realize how much of this fascination I had with power tools and whether or not this drill had more power than that drill. I'm, I'm fascinated with uh, 
baseball pitchers that can throw really hard or guys that can hit really far home runs. I'm, I'm fascinated even with relational power. Um, I was watching this movie, Zootopia, where it looks like the, the polar bears have this extreme relational power, like they're the, they're the powerhouse guys, but it's really this tiny little mole, and the, the mole is the one that's commanding everyone, and he's saying, ice them, like that, that's really fascinating to me, that's, that's really intriguing to me. Um, so the, it, draw, it makes this, this, um, this scenario, this situation uh, come to life, because Jesus is indicating, hey, listen, I have the ability to escape this, I have the ability to escape this, yet I'm laying down my divine right, my divine privilege, so that I can serve you. I can ask my Father in heaven for more than 12 legions of angels, and so real quick math, 12 legions of angels, that's like 72,000 angels, and we know from the Old Testament that one is enough. One's enough. Why, why 72,000? Why? For, for me, this, this, looking at this scene, thinking about this scene that's going on, really illuminates Philippians 2 for me. It makes this word jump off the page. In Philippians 2, 8, it says that he humbled himself. He humbled himself. It, this, this scene blows up for me any misconceptions of humility that I previously had. Clearly, Jesus is not a doormat. He's, he's definitely not a nobody. And the thing is, is he's not really playing down, he's not playing down his abilities at all. He's taking and he's using his position to serve Peter, to serve us. He's laying down his life willingly. What, what's fascinating is, is he struggled to do so. He struggled, and, we, and we, saw, we saw him struggle to do this. If he struggled, fully God and fully man, we will struggle as well. So how do we approach projects with the attitude of humility? The first thing is ask for directions. So very simply, you're just asking God for help. We saw Jesus do this. We, we can do this as well. It's not, it's not complicated. Just, hey, I, I recognize that I need some help here. Lord, will you help me? The next is, is get a proper perspective. Um, on, on who you are. Ephesians 2 says this. It says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ. Even though we are dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace. He gives those who trust in him the gift of grace. Not only that, but he gives us everything that we own or have or have the abilities. This is what... Um, Cl- First Corinthians says, it says, what do you have that you did not receive? In fact, you did receive it, so why do you boast as if you hadn't received it? Everything that you have, you've been given. Your shoes, your clothes, your mental ability, your position, your car, name it. It's been given to you. It is a gift. The next thing is put on your humble clothes. Put on your humble clothes. This, this is easier said than done. Um, I have two kids, and so getting ready for anything is pretty difficult to do. Um, or deciding like, oh, I, I really want to wear this shirt, and then you find out that that shirt's dirty or needs to be ironed or, or whatever the, the case may be. Uh, but generally, mo- most people, they figure out what they're going to wear before they get to a place. So put on your humble clothes. This is what uh, Colossians 3 says. It says, Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on humility. And this is what 1 Peter says. It says, All of you clothe yourselves with humility. So instead of putting on your proud shirt for the day, put on your humble shirt and pants for the day. It's something that you're deliberately making a choice to do. Uh, the, The next thing is to look for examples. 
Um, you're, you're looking for examples in Christ. You're looking for examples uh, throughout Scripture. Paul alludes to, hey, listen, in, the, in the latter part of Philippians 2, he, he points to these two, two, two guys. Uh, one of them's name is Normal. His name's Timothy. The other guy's name is Epaphroditus. That's not, you know, you don't normally name your kid that. Uh, he, he says, hey, wait, listen, look. Look to their example. They're genuinely concerned about you. They're, they're, they're a model of Jesus in the flesh. Um, and then the other thing is, that, that, that we can do as a church is we can look to examples of hum, humble people in the church. And so I've invited uh, Jim and Margaret Ann Weister to, to, to come up and to share a little bit. Um, if, if, if you don't know Jim and Margaret Ann, they've been a part of a number of different churches. They, they served in a number of different positions. Like I said, Jim has been a pastor uh, and a chaplain, and Margaret Ann has served as secretary, whether paid or, or volunteer. Um, and so when, when Operation Oddfellows came along, they, they jumped right in, and they, they pitched in, and they helped, whether it was cleaning up the debris that came from this ceiling in here, or painting walls, or painting ceilings even. And so they didn't skip a beat to buy up this opportunity to, to serve. And so I wanted to ask them a couple of questions, and one of them is just to help, uh, help us to, to know you guys a little bit better. And so uh, if you guys don't mind, could you share how you got to Kansas City and how you got plugged in to the Grove? I retired uh, from the base and off it about uh, five or six years ago. And our plan was to move down here because our daughter and her family are down here. But at the time, I was serving as a pastor at a local chapel in a uh, old 55 and older apartment complex, which we fit into. Didn't want to, but we did. But anyway, that was our plan. But uh, that wasn't God's plan. Well, it was God's plan, but we weren't on his timetable. He moved our timetable up. Uh, one of the ways we knew that he moved the timetable up was because uh, there was 10 foot of water in our house in uh, 2019. And corn cobs on the roof. You don't want to see corn cobs on your roof. Uh, not really. But uh, that led us down here. I'll let Margaret Ann do a little bit better explanation. And that was March 17th, 2019. We came here to look for a place to live in June of 2019 and stayed two months with our daughter and bought the house that we live in now um, and started looking during that time for a church home. And we, we looked for many different ones. Uh, in fact, we, we visited Pleasant Valley and liked it, but it's big. And I knew, we both knew, having grown up in churches, that it takes a lot of time and effort to become a family in a big church and a small church. So I went online and started looking for churches near us, and we visited several, and finally decided, okay, we'll bite the bullet and go to the Grove, because we knew that Pleasant Valley had, had been the sponsoring church for the Grove, and so we were pretty comfortable with the beliefs that were here. Uh, we walked in to the gym and felt like we were back at Life Spring Church in, in Bellevue, Nebraska, because when we moved there, the first time we were members there, we were meeting in the gym. And so it was like coming home, which is probably the only place that I felt comfortable of coming home. And it took us a while. We tried, we plugged in, but it takes a while. And so we became members in, in January of 2020, and I thought, okay, now then we will truly become the family we want to be. And COVID hit. Yeah. And and literally, the the 52 week anniversary of when we got flooded out was the first Sunday we had to do online. Mm. And I needed that Sunday, mm. but God had other plans. 
but we found the grove by looking at the Missouri Baptist Convention and finding a church. Yeah, and in, in the midst of your story, um, this building popped up and, and, and you guys helped out and you helped out a lot. So what, what made you guys want to help out so much in the way that you did? Well, part of it is that's just who we are. Uh, I'm a birth preacher's daughter. My dad was a pastor when I was born. I will be 70 years old in December, and I have probably been going to church since I was a week old. I was born on Saturday, so I was probably in church the next Sunday. And this is just who you do. And Jim's parents were very active in church, and then his dad decided to be a pastor. But the other thing is, we were not family. I, I thought about this this morning. We were kind of like in-laws. You know, we had just gotten married. We had just become a part of your church, of this, build, of this body. And we wanted to be family, but we weren't quite family. Now, we were family because we're all family in, in, in God's family. But we weren't that real family. We've become family. You are our family. When family needs help, you help them. I just had a conversation about that this morning, in fact. <laughs> when family needs help, you help them. And that's what we did. It's awesome. Well, I, I echo the fact that uh, when you're part of a family, you just pitch in. I have known families that that's not true. And it's, it's, it's sad. It really is. Uh, we went on a mission trip with the youth. Uh, because we were there, we made really good friends with other people from our church that we didn't even know before we went on the mission trip. I mean, God brings you together. Uh, on that mission trip, we did things that I hadn't done. I flipped, how many hot dogs did we flip? Uh, over 500. Over 500 hot dogs. So if, oh. if you need to do grill hot dogs, just fast. That, that, <laughs> that, yeah. that to me is a real picture of your humility. You're willing to pitch in to help make things happen, even if it's outside of the normal job yeah. description, yeah. such as flipping and, hot dogs. And we were in our, we were in our 60s. And you know what I, ended, I spent over a half an hour doing <laughs> on that mission trip? A 60-year-old man playing catch with a football with older teenagers. That's awesome. You know, just because it happened. Yeah. You know, it happened. Uh, what, let me ask this question. Uh, you guys are talking about how you've served. Um, one of the questions I want to ask you is, who in your life has big, been the biggest example of humility? For, for, this is for both of you. Yeah. Well, there's, a, there's numerous people that come to mind. I can't name the person who was the biggest example. Uh, not really. But the one that came to mind as far as current is a man by the name of Don Swenson. Unfortunately, Don's not alive right now. He uh, passed away. You know, he, was, he was a World War II vet. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, I pastored a chapel at uh, Tregaron Apartments in Bellevue, Nebraska for 12 months. A little over 12 months. 12 years. 12 years, yeah. I'm, time flies. Uh, 12 years. And the first person that I met there really was Don Swenson and his wife Joanne. And Don passed out songbooks. Don passed out bulletins. And it got to the point where Don had to sit down to do his job. Hmm. Don and his wife were the ones that set the furniture up on, on Saturday nights and Sunday morning and, and, and all. You know, they just did it. That was just what they did. They didn't expect you to go up and say, hey, Don, you're such a great person. You know, I used to fire him every other Sunday because he would make a, he would not get a, a 
bulletin to somebody or something, and I'd cut his wages in half, and <laughs> then the next Sunday he'd cut my wages in half. Uh, half a zero, zero, you know. <laughs> Every once in a while we'd get them doubled, <laughs> you, know? you know. But he was humble. He didn't, he, he just that was there. That's awesome. And if you'd have tried to build him up, he'd, he'd tell you, well, he's just doing what he's doing. Kyle mentioned that I have been secretary f doing this and that in the church, both volunteer and paid, but I was a paid secretary for our church in Nebraska for three years in the children's department. And as I was thinking about this, and like Jim said, it's hard. I've known so many. But the man that finally came to mind was the facility manager. But Mr. Leroy probably still to this day doesn't think he's a facility manager. He had, was retired from Union Pacific Railroad. And I, knowing Union Pacific, I know he had a very good job. But to this day, I don't think people realize in our church of over a thousand what Mr. Leroy did. Now my favorite picture was him, him walking down the big long hallway by my office rolling two round tables, one in each hand. And the man was 70. But I worked for the children's minister and uh, Mr. Leroy didn't always like to see me come because I had a request from Kelly. And I'd say, oh, Mr. Leroy, and he'd say, oh, no. <laughs> he always did it. He was always gracious. And it was always just what he did. They would be there, him and his wife, to pick up trash after church. They would just do things. Uh, Mr. Leroy was part-time. Mr. Leroy spent his life at, at Life Spring Church in Delta. So I realized that he's probably one of the biggest pictures of humility because he's had some position and yet, he became the janitor, <laughs> and willingly became the manager, the, the janitor, and the maintenance man, and, and the most special guy around. Thank you guys. Thank you guys for sharing. Would you guys thank the Weasters for me? Well, thank you guys for, for sharing. Uh, we'll wrap our time up and pray. Father, I'm, I'm very grateful for the Weasters and their humility and the examples of humility that you have given them in their life um, so that you can be honored and that you can be glorified. Lord, help us as a church, help us as a people to choose the way of humility. Uh, help us to emulate you. Help us to take up the mindset of Christ to best represent you. And so you be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing together.
Sunday, so it's a little bit more than barbecues and grilling out. And so we want to remember the fall. And so let me pray for you. Oh, yeah, my mic's not on, so you have a little bit harder time hearing me. Now my hand is yep. So we want to recognize that Memorial Day is a little bit more than barbecues and grilling out. So let me pray for you. Father, we, we recognize that our, our freedom isn't free, um, that a lot of people paid a, a great price to so that we could worship freely today. And so thank you for the help us to move forward together as a country unified. And may many people, because of their sacrifice, come to know you as you. Um, also, we have our traditional moment. And so I want to... These are my friends. Uh, I'm going to use a made-up name because of the nature of their job and uh, their situation. Uh, this is John and Sarah and their little baby. Um, and so John and Sarah are serving in the Middle East as missionaries with the IMB. And so what, uh, we were able to, I was able to connect with him and they were able to stay with us last September. And they have some really cool Only God stories. Um, and so I, I hope that you guys get a chance for your pass across. But we're going to pray for them. Um, and so, if, again, you would join me in prayer. We're, we're almost finished. Lord, I, I thank you so much for John and Sarah and the work that you're doing there. Lord, please continue to allow people to have visions and dreams of Jesus and allow John and Sarah to come in contact with these people. Give them uh, housing as, as they need. Um, create stability in their land. And Lord, I, I, I just ask that you would use them to train and develop leaders to make your name known. Lord, we love you and thank you for those who are going out. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, now may the God of grace and, and comfort of the Holy Spirit and the love of Christ be with you now. You guys have a great day and a great weekend.